what's outside the universe? My friend Melody asked me this question when I was eight years old. I usually had good answers for science questions. I was sort of a library guy. But this time, I had no idea what to say. The question scared me. I grew up in southern Utah in the western part of the United States, and this is the home of red rocks, hot, dry summer nights, clear skies, and these are perfect conditions for stargazing. And as a kid, Melody and I would often bicycle out of town to get away from the lights of the city, and we would look up at the sky and we would ask each other questions about the cosmos. How big is the Earth? What is the sun made of? How far away is that galaxy there? Why can't I see a black hole? What's at the edge of the universe? When she asked me that one, I stopped Call and I thought me. about it. And finally I said, I don't know. And Melody said, my ancestors thought that the Earth was a big flat rock with a solid dome of sky a few kilometers above, and the stars were painted on the dome, and it was all held in the hand of a big creature that would occasionally shake it. And we stared up at this dome of stars, and eventually I said, well, they didn't have telescopes back then, so I guess that's a good first guess, but now that we know that the universe is huge, I don't know what's at the edge of the universe. Melody was an indigenous Native American Indian from a local tribe. I don't remember if she was Paiute or Navajo. And the other kids at school would sometimes make fun of Melody, calling her nasty names. She didn't like homework, she didn't like tests, but she ran circles around the other kids in classroom discussions with the teacher. And there was a reason why she and I were friends, because Melody was never afraid to ask the big question. And when she finally asked me, what's outside? the universe. The question caught me off guard. Well, nothing. The universe is everything, and it doesn't make any sense to ask what's outside of everything. Everything is everything. Yeah, but if the universe has an edge, there must be something beyond the edge, she reasoned. And we thought about it for a long time, and finally I said, maybe there is no edge and no outside. And Melody said, yeah, maybe the universe just goes on forever and ever, and that's all there is. And then finally, after a long pause, I said, everything is terrifying. And as you can see, I was an extremely serious child. <laughs> um, maybe not so completely serious, because to me, terrifying doesn't have to be a bad thing. But before we go too far, we need to answer a very important question. What is the universe? Picture the last time you were out in wilderness and you looked up at the night sky. Thousands of pinpoints of light, photons from stars and galaxies, thousands of light years away, a light year being the distance that light travels in one year, to finally reach Earth and smack into your eyes. When you look up at the constellations, you're looking backward in time. But look closer. Between two of those points of light, what do you see? It looks like empty space, but it's not. Your eyes are pretty good photon detectors for one particular type of photon, but on cosmic scales, your eyes are terrible experimental apparatuses because they can only see a relatively narrow range of photon wavelengths. And there's much more smacking into the Earth than what we can see with our eyes. <clears throat> If you were to use humanity's best photon detectors, like satellite telescopes, you'd see hidden light, photons from stars and galaxies millions and billions of light years away. And eventually, if you keep looking, you will see something absolutely remarkable, the cosmic microwave background radiation, light, signals from when the universe was only a few hundred thousand years old. This is the closest that we can get to a baby picture of our universe. Elimination. But wait a minute. Baby picture? A few hundred thousand years old? That's a pretty old baby. Make it count. 
Where's the light from before then? Most of that light hasn't had time to reach us yet, and most of it never will. The universe is expanding. All of those galaxies you can see with your eyes, they're all moving away from each other in all directions. The universe is expanding, but expanding into what? Is our universe like a, a limp balloon put into a box and then you blow it up and the balloon is inflated into the box? No. So what's expanding? Space itself is expanding. The background metric spatial grid upon which everything rests is being stretched, even inside your body right now, completely imperceptibly. Two galaxies in our universe are like two pins stuck into a rubber sheet that is then being pulled from all directions. From the perspective of an ant on the sheet, nothing happened to make the pins move. The, the, the fabric of space itself, the sheet, is being stretched, and the distance between them is increasing. Thus, if everything in the universe is moving apart from everything else, we can simply run the clock backward, and at some point, everything in the universe had to be packed into a tiny, dense little point, which then started expanding. And this, as you know, is the concept of the Big Only Bang. But it's not Don't just the fact of the universe's expansion that is interesting. It's the particular Your way that it did so throughout its history. There's so practice. much that we can't explain right now if the universe always expanded at a constant Go rate. Why are there big things in the universe at all, like galaxies and cosmic structures that clever astronomers can see? Why does the stuff in that part of the sky more or less look like the stuff in the other part of the sky over there? Why is this cosmic microwave background radiation essentially uniform in temperature everywhere? Don't let the color coding fool you. My astrophysics colleagues are quite clever to show the tiny gradations, but that's basically constant. None of this stuff makes any sense unless at the moment of the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago, the universe didn't just start expanding at a constant rate, but instead insanely inflated and then tapered off to a much more gradual rate. And this, this inflation was not just some minor thing. Imagine if we took a horse and magically inflated it to the size of the observable universe now in 10 to the minus 32 seconds. That's what inflation was like at the moment of the Big Bang. This inflation was much faster than the speed of light. And as you know, if something in the universe, if, if we're ever going to know that something exists in the universe, we have to receive some kind of a light signal from it. Thus, if this expansion was much faster than the speed of light, most of the stuff in the universe was immediately separated from us and we'll never be able to, to detect it ever. Only one enemy remains. And it gets worse. Don't let them catch their no, sorry. <laughs> so it does get worse. But so thus we're left with a new concept, not just the universe, but the observable universe, which is a tiny volume, a subset of the entire universe within which there must be a large number of other observable universes for other observers, and we'll never be able to contact them ever. And it does get worse. If you look closely, and you should always do this when someone gives you a physical theory, if you look closely at the math behind it, really at the details of the math behind this insane inflation of the fabric of space, this insane inflation should go on forever. But in our universe, it didn't. It tapered off and is going to, has been going at a much more gradual rate for the rest of the universe's history. You're in the lead. Keep. This me our universe is essentially a little pocket that was popped into existence by this insane inflation of the fabric of space, like a little bubble that popped up and is kind of just floating there in this gradual thing. But if you look closely at that insane inflation, it should go on forever. But in our universe, it didn't. One universe popped up, but this, this inflation should go on for infinity. And as you know, with infinity, if something happens once, it happens again. And again, One minute and again, left. there must be, if our understanding of this inflation is correct, there must be an almost infinite number of other universes that were also popped into existence by this insane inflation of the 
the fabric of space. Can you face that? In most of them, uh, structure probably never formed, and, and there was nothing, the constants of nature were wrong, so that nothing ever formed, and, and there's no humans, there's no life, there's no nothing. But with infinity, there must be other universes like ours. In one of them, one of you wore different shoes here today. In another, coffee is pink. And in another, an Earth-like planet was obliterated by an asteroid just as protozoans were starting to evolve. If our understanding of inflation is correct, this mathematics of inflation is correct, then this isn't just some science fiction idea, but is required Only by infinity. Left. But I can see the looks on some of your faces, and you're absolutely right to be skeptical, because look, I'm a scientist, right? You should be screaming at me, this is a fine idea, but where is the evidence, man? We need demonstration, and you're absolutely right. As it stands now, this is just a circumstantial evidence idea, right? It's not enough to claim a discovery, and no one's claiming such a thing. But it turns out this is not the only piece of circumstantial evidence that we have. Um, <laughs> our universe seems to be filled with magic numbers, constants of nature that we measure and we know what their value are, but we, can't have, we don't have any particular explanation for why these values are what they are. And one of them is very important, it's uh, called the, the, the mass of the Higgs boson. You don't need to know what that is now, but it's related to this particle that my, partic uh, my, my colleagues and I discovered at the Large Hadron Collider a few years ago. And this particle is a very important and very weird particle. As a reminder, the Large Hadron Collider is a 27-kilometer circular tunnel on the border of France and Switzerland. And these, just to go back up one second, so these constants of nature or these things that we measure, there's a lot of them, and this Higgs boson mass is just one that I'm going to talk about. But if any of these values were, in fact, a little bit different, our universe would be a vastly different place. And one of them has to do with this Higgs boson discovered here at the Large Hadron Collider, 27 kilometers on the border of France and Switzerland. And for contrast, this is what it would look like if it were around Malmo. So I don't know if anyone lives out in this small town called Oxy, but uh, if, you happened, if, if you happened to uh, uh, live there and you were a proton, you could get to Slaghuset in about uh, a few nanoseconds uh, in, the, in the Large Hadron Collider. Because in this machine, we take superconducting magnets that are colder than outer space, and we use them to accelerate protons, you're made of protons, to almost the speed of light. And then we smash them into each other millions of times per second. And we collect a debris of these collisions to look for, uh, to then sift through all of this data that we collect to look for evidence of new undiscovered particles that could answer some of the biggest open questions of physics. And the bigness of these open questions of physics is nicely concordant with the bigness of the experiment. And so the experiment that I work on is one of the places at the four places on the ring where you bend these beams into each other and a collision happens. And the place where the collision happens, you better build a gigantic detector because quantum field theory magic is gonna happen. And by gigantic, I mean gigantic. Uh, this one here, whoops, there we go. Oh, it's not in this version. Well, you can see at the very end of this slide, the gigantic thing. The one that I work on is called Atlas. It's six stories high, it's 46 meters long, and if you come in the next year and a half at CERN, we're in a cur currently a kind of a shutdown mode, you can actually go downstairs and see it, so I highly encourage you all to come. Um, but so the bigness of these experiments is nicely concordant with the bigness of the questions that we're trying to answer. And some of them are gigantic. For example, why is every galaxy in the universe spinning way faster than it should? So uh, take your favorite Hubble telescope photo of a galaxy, like a spiral galaxy. I love to look at Hub Hubble photos, and I've never gotten rid of that love. Take your favorite one, and then count up all the stuff you can see, all the stars and all the gas and stuff. This gives you an estimate of the amount of visible matter in the universe. And now, take your favorite textbook on gravity and general relativity. I assume all of you have a textbook on general relativity on the bedside, like I do. You take that matter, you plug it into the equation that says how fast a star should be moving as a function of how far away from the center of the galaxy it is. It just gets a straightforward calculation. Now, go out and measure how fast those stars are moving. It's way off from the prediction. And it's not just a little bit off, it's way off. And it's not just one galaxy, it's all of them. Everyone is completely wrong. This means that one of two things is really wrong. Either gravity is wrong, and it's probably not. Or 
there's got to be more stuff there than what we can see with our eyes. And if it's not light, if it doesn't interact with light, then it's dark, hence dark matter. And it turns out there's not just a little dark matter. As you can see from the deviation there, there's about five to six times more dark matter in the universe than there is you matter. Every single one of you probably has about a billion particles of dark matter flowing through your body every second, and you've never felt it, and you never will. So this gives you a sense as to this is kind of an important question. We should figure out what the answer to this is. Is it a particle? Is it something else? So this is one of the big questions that we can, we can address at the Large Hadron Collider. And prior to its turning on about 10 years ago, there were a large number of big questions, and one of them had to do with this Higgs boson particle, which is a very important particle, a very weird particle. And it's important because without the Higgs boson particle, you would not be here right now. Your opponent is so falling the Higgs boson is a very Shouldn't important particle. Well, let me just, so prior to it turning on, the LHC turning on, this was a big open question. Is the Higgs boson, does it exist? Does this Higgs field exist? Um, and then after, at once 2012 ran, uh, came around, we discovered this particle. It was fantastic. There was champagne and celebration and two white males won a Nobel Prize. What else is new? And there was also a little, little bit of head scratching cool. too, because Victory. honestly, we probably shouldn't have discovered this particle at all. This the particle is important is for the following reason. <laughs> um, the Higgs boson is not the most important thing about this discovery. We talk about this all the time, the boson, and if you know anything about particle physics, it has a particular, that means particular values of some of its intrinsic properties, doesn't matter. But the boson particle, the but particle part, is not the most the important thing. The most important part of this discovery was the fact that the Higgs boson demonstrates conclusively that there's something called the Higgs field that exists. And the Higgs field is more or less an invisible jelly that permeates all of space everywhere. You don't feel it, but your particles do. And your particles feel this field because they have mass. And mass for a particle is not the same thing that you and I use in a colloquial sense. It's like, whoa, look at that massive building or something like that. Mass for particles is an intrinsic property. It's a number put there by nature. And it seems that certain particles have certain types of masses because they're dragged a little bit by this Higgs field. If I'm a, an electron and I'm zipping through space, a little bit of my kinetic energy is stuck into a point that we measure as mass. And this is related to this concept of E equals mc squared. And this is one of Einstein's most famous equations, showing that there's an equivalence between energy and mass. And energy, would, you know, but then mass is this thing where it's stuck a little bit into a point and we measure this thing as mass. And it's really good that this Higgs field exists because if you're, for example, if electrons had a zero mass in the absence of a Higgs field, if your electrons had a zero mass, you and I would not be here to have this discussion because an electron with a zero mass would never have started to form atoms in the early universe. And it's pretty good that atoms started to form. <laughs> So this is, this is one example as to why you know, it's important that, we, that, that, that this type of a discovery actually gives us larger uh, implications as to, what, you know, uh, 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 as to our place in the universe. And again, I'm, I'm seeing some of the looks on your faces, and of course you should again be yelling at me, invisible jelly, how are you going to demonstrate that? It's a very good question. Imagine if you were, uh, imagine you're standing on a bridge in the night, completely dark night. You're standing on this bridge, and a friend has told you that down below underneath the bridge, there's a muddy river. Maybe you're an enthusiast of muddy rivers. You have like an Instagram account that's dedicated to muddy rivers. I don't know. But you're there, and you look down, and you don't see anything. It's a completely pitch black night. You look down, and you don't see a thing at all. You have a flashlight. You, you, you shine the flashlight down, Guardians. and you can't see anything Make moving. It, it just looks like dirt. You think maybe your friend has lied to you. So you think, how from up here, it's maybe you know, 100 meters below or something, how from up here could I ever possibly demonstrate that there's a river down there? You could drop a rock. So you drop a rock, and just as it splashes, you hit, see a little splash that exists for a small amount of time, but then it dies and it goes into a completely uh, flat space again. You've demonstrated very temporarily and briefly that that field or that that uh, that muddy river does indeed exist. 
And in this case, the Muddy River is this invisible Higgs field. And the rock, or I'm sorry, the, the, the vortex, that little, that little splash, that's the Higgs boson particle. And the rock is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. If you take reality and smack it just right, with just the right resonant frequency, you can make this Higgs boson vibrate into existence for a small amount of time before it then decays and goes back into nothing. So this is how we were able to demonstrate that this Higgs field existed. And without the Higgs field, you would not be here right now because atoms would not have formed. So it's good that the Higgs field exists. But again, go back to the math. Anytime someone so shows you something about a physical theory, go and talk it, look at the math. If you look at the math behind all this stuff, there's nothing to prevent our Higgs boson mass from being something gigantically high all way outside of the range of the Large Hadron Collider. There's nothing to prevent that. And in physics, if something is not prevented, it has to happen. But we found the Higgs boson down here. Again, it's really good that we did, because you would not be here if we had not found this Higgs boson with this particular mass. But there's got to be something that's preventing it from being all the way up here. One good idea is if there were some extra particles that we also discovered at the Large Hadron Collider, that through some complicated interactions, they help regulate the Higgs boson mass and kind of keep it bumped right where we discovered it. Only that would be great. We do not see Only these particles at the Large Hadron away. Collider. Don't let them catch their breath. That why is the Higgs boson mass sitting they right where it is? And you it Did in we just face. get lucky? Superb. Maybe it is just luck, is but a particular type top. of luck. Nature loves statistical distributions. I doubt you will hear a nerdier statement all day long. Nature loves statistical distributions. And the average resting heart rate of everyone in this room will be distributed as a Gaussian distribution. If you stand on the street corner, the rate with which cars will pass you follows some kind of Poisson distribution. Nature loves statistical distributions, and in a sense, it seems like sometimes physics, uh, sorry, math Only and statistics transcend our universe. Only one so what if our Higgs Don't boson mass is only one of a possibly infinite number of Higgs boson masses because in a multiverse? Left of them. One of them was stable led to a stable universe where you and I are here to have this discussion. And most of the other ones, the Higgs boson mass was something completely different. And these are completely dull, empty, void universes. And you never want a vacation there. The lack of extra particles at the Large Hadron Collider is not definitive demonstration proof that we live in a multiverse. But it's another circumstantial hint that we should take seriously this idea. But again, I see and acknowledge and love the looks on your faces right now because you're absolutely right. Again, tell me, listen, man, you're a scientist. You need evidence, and you're absolutely 100% right. You need to ask the question, how are we ever going to possibly test this idea? Is it just philosophy, or is it something we could possibly demonstrate and test? That's a very good question. The answer to it is that <clears throat> we have some ideas, but they're currently either very weird or technologically <clears throat> challenging to do at the moment. Um, one way is that we could look for a bruise on our universe. Remember that almost infinite number of universes in the multiverse due to this inflation of the fabric of space? What if two of them inflated or it, you know, evolved right next to each other, expanded right next to each other, and bumped into each other as they, as they expanded? Could that be what this little cold spot is here on this baby picture of the universe? It remains to be seen whether this conclusion is supported by the evidence, by the data, better than some other conclusion, but it's an open part, it's an open direction of inquiry right now. Another way is to look for new revolutionary high mass particles that we haven't discovered yet, aka my day job. The largeness of experiments like the Large Hadron Collider is important because bigger machines allow you to go f to higher energies and go back to the Einstein equation. If nature has a particle with a mass m that's all the way up here, and we as a species have only ever built a collider that goes up to energy here, 
we'll never be able to discover it and measure its properties. Thus, we need to push to directions, push to energy regimes, larger machines, where we simply haven't looked yet, because that's where the discoveries could be hiding. We don't choose where nature puts the discoveries. We only choose to keep exploring. So a few months ago, we announced at CERN our, uh, a proposal plan to potentially build a, an even bigger collider at CERN. This would be the future circular collider. If the Large Hadron Collider is 27 kilometers around, this would be 100 kilometers around. And I live right in the middle there, somewhere there. Um, so this would be 100 kilometers around. It would allow us to get up to seven times the energies of what we can right now at the Large Hadron Collider. This would open up unparalleled potential discovery uh, opportunities. But if we don't discover new particles at this, L at this FCC, because it, it actually would be OK. So if we discover these extra particles to help regulate the Higgs mass, if we discover them just outside of the range of the Large Hadron Collider, well within the range of this thing, that would only be a little bit weird. It would totally be really nice for us. We'd be like, OK, our universe is fine. It's awesome. Let's move on to other things to, to study. We don't have to worry about whether we live in a multiverse. It would be OK. But if we build this thing and we don't find new particles, would that satisfy me? Would that be satisfying enough for me to say, I think that we live in a multiverse? No. We would have to go bigger. Why not go as big as possible? Why not think big? Let's build a particle collider around the circumference of the moon. This would allow us to get to energies that are tens of thousands of times the energies of the Large Hadron Collider and allow us to enter completely unparalleled discovery potential. And you might think this is kind of a crazy idea, but think about it. There's a lot of innovators right now that are interested in going to the moon, setting up some kind of a moon base, doing some kind of moon uh, mining or things like that. Why not work together and make this happen? But obviously, I can't do this alone. I have a list of things. I know what I want from this project. I have a list of things that I'm going to need from somebody in this audience so that we can make this happen, okay? I'm going to need 11,000 kilometers worth of extremely strong magnets that don't currently exist. I'm going to need an amazing space transport system for personnel stuff, uh, you, know, uh, uh, res uh, you know, supplies, okay, something that's robust and, 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 and reliable. I need some kind of tunnel scouting and engineering and digging that doesn't currently exist. You know, we need to build a tunnel around the circumference of the moon. But wait a minute, maybe we don't need to build a tunnel. Maybe we can just put it on the surface and shield it from, from radiation and we'll be good. So maybe we don't need some kind of self-directed wow. robots to do tunnel maybe scouting. Maybe we just need robots to do this, the, the, the stuff on the surface. So if you're a robotic person, get on this right now. I also need the next generation of particle uh, detector, the stuff that I work on at Atlas. This, this, we, we need things that are much, much more uh, finely uh, grained than we currently do. We need them to scale up much, much larger because the energy coming out of this collision is going to be way bigger than what we can currently measure with our current technology. I need data science methods that don't currently exist. The amount of data that would be coming out of this machine, we run for a few decades, exabyte level, probably lots more than that. Okay, So I need methods that don't exist yet to do uh, uh, data uh, uh, machine learning, deep learning ideas. I need some kind of robust Earth to moon uh, uh, data transfer system that's robust against solar flares and other types of disruptions. I need some kind of next generation power. Are we going to use nuclear on the, on, on the moon? Maybe we could just use solar because there's copious uh, sun coming in because there's no atmosphere. I also need all the other stuff I haven't thought of yet. So what if we build the moon collider? would I then be satisfied? Maybe we build the Moon Collider, we don't find any new particles at all, and we then, I can then say, yes, we know that we live in a multiverse. Whoa. The answer is no, that's not big enough. No, to answer the question definitively, we would actually have to reach an energy called the Planck energy. We would have to reach something called the Planck scale. And this is such an unimaginably high energy scale at which everything about physics would be revealed. We would know everything about gravity, about dark matter, about how gravity and quantum mechanics work together, everything about neutrinos, about matter versus antimatter, about probably whether we live in a multiverse. We would need know everything about this. But to reach the Planck energy in a collider experiment, we would probably have to build a particle collider around the outer edge of the solar system. 
Clearly, we're going to need some major innovation to make this happen. But luckily, we are at the conference, the conference, okay? And a place where I can't seem to walk three meters without running into a world-changing innovator or an aspiring world-changing innovator. So catch me, uh, catch me afterwards, and we'll brainstorm ways to make this happen. Um, <laughs> So this is the ultimate Hadron Collider. <laughs> if we were to build this ultimate Hadron Collider, and we will, Ooh. what will we do on the with the answers that we get from it? Even if we Bang. were to provide overwhelming circumstantial evidence that you and I live in a multiverse, there's currently no way for us to ever contact or interact with another universe. Such a concept currently makes no sense. Thus, are such questions meaningless? You may say yes. And in fact, some scientists would agree with you. And in fact, some scientists attack our attempts to learn more about such questions by, uh, by attacking our plans to build, say, this FCC at CERN, saying that such questions are unscientific. But is that true? We started with known science, observations of the world around us, and we followed the chain of logic to arrive at the conclusion that we might live in a multiverse. No one's claiming that's the truth, but it's a possibility. It's very startling and scary, but it is definitely scientific. Just because we can't answer the question now doesn't mean that we never will. This sort of thing sounds impossible, but impossible, this is definitely impossible, impossible, but something like a moon collider that's just regular impossible. And regular impossible we can do. Regular impossible is only impossible right up until that moment when somebody makes it possible. So, if we, so, so does that mean that these questions are non-scientific? It definitely does not. These are definitely scientific questions. So why do people object to questions like this? Could it be that they're afraid of the answer? Could it be that this is a similar fear that led people to object to questions, similar questions in the past, such as, is the Earth really at the center of the solar system? Or are the stars painted on a solid dome a kilometer above our heads? The fear that you and I are not really as special as we think we are. Perhaps more accurately, the fear that what you know right now is not all there is to know. But this fear is perhaps even more fundamental than the fear of knowledge or the fear that we are irrelevant to the universe. And it seems that we kind of are. It could be the fear of reconceptualizing humanity's very existence. A curious thing happens when you study physics, particle physics, quantum mechanics, and then quantum field theory for eight years. You start with the basic physical objects we encounter every day, like rocks and clouds, and you think about how they do anything, how they sit still, how they move, how they exist in these states. And you do that, and to do that, you consider the forces that act on them. So these are standard, everyday ideas that we as humans have evolved with and that are understandable to us. You calculate the various forces acting on a bridge, and you're pleased to understand why physics exists to help structural engineers design safe roads and buildings. And then you learn that the same essential set of ideas can help us understand why and how a rock thrown into the air will return to the Earth's surface and how the planets, stars, and galaxies move around each other, how electricity works, how a light bulb shines, etc. And then you take all these ideas and you go very small. Very small, to the realm of the smallest things imaginable, un individual, uncuttable particles. And while many of the same principles apply there too, very quickly, things become extremely different. At some point, you realize that our understanding of particles being discrete, separate chunks of stuff breaks down. You realize that depending upon how you look at it, something like an electron, for example, is either a particle, a small chunk of stuff, or is instead a miniature localized packet of vibrating waves. This wave-particle duality is not just some crazy idea, but is an observation and consequence of quantum mechanics. 
which is filled with starting, startling conclusions like this that challenge our big, bulky human conceptions of reality. And depending upon how you look at them, these conclusions are either limitations or liberations. For example, it's fundamentally impossible for me to know with arbitrary precision simultaneously where a given electron is and how fast it's moving. You might think that's strange, and you're right. Here on the surface of the Earth, I can stand still and watch, at, watch you as you zip past me in a wheelchair, and I will know exactly where you are the whole time, and I will know exactly how fast you're moving. With an electron, this is impossible. The more precisely I know the electron's position, the less I know about how fast it's moving. And the more precisely I know its speed, the less I know about where it is. This is wild. My human desire and hubris compels me to think that if I just work hard enough, just figure out some clever method, just wait for an advanced enough civilization, I should be able to know everything about everything. Isn't that superficially one of the driving forces of science? But quantum mechanics says this is fundamentally impossible. There are limits to our knowledge, and not just science knowledge, not just regular knowledge, but knowledge itself. This is what the taking. That's humbling and liberating, because these ideas challenge our core understandings of reality and force us to reframe our view of humanity's place in the world. It's disorienting, and it gets worse, because it turns out that quantum mechanics is not the end of the story. When you take individual chunks of stuff and accelerate them to very high speeds, those approaching the speed of light, you realize that qu standard quantum mechanics doesn't cut it anymore. The behavior of a thing moving at almost the speed of light is best described by something called special relativity, another set of wild ideas that completely overturned our understanding of time and space. And when you combine this description with quantum mechanics, you get something called quantum field theory, the implications of which are absolutely breathtaking. Quantum field theory begins with the notion that for a given kind of particle, like our electron, every single electron in the universe is fundamentally indistinguishable from every other electron. Let's say I put a bunch of tennis balls in a washing machine. I can paint one of them black, and after letting them bump around for a while, I can easily find that black tennis ball still among the many yellow ones. I can tag an uh, a, a tennis ball. I cannot tag an electron. If I try to keep track of an electron, I send toward an atom, for example, an atom that already has a bunch of electrons swarming around it, and the electron bumps into the atom, and another, another electron comes flying out the other side. It's impossible for me to state which electron this is and where the electron I sent in is now. There's no way to tag an electron. This means that an electron in an atom here in my hand and an electron currently in a star on the other side of the Milky Way are fundamentally identical. <laughs> so perhaps the best way to think about an electron at all is not as an individual chunk of stuff, scare, but when a discrete the piece scorn, of the universe that I can track like a black tennis ball, case. but instead, perhaps an electron is really an excitation right, in a background quantum field that permeates all of space all throughout the universe. In this way of viewing things, the most fundamental object in the universe is not a particle, not an individual chunk of something, but, universe, but instead the universe-wide field that is everywhere all the time and from which any given particle can vibrate into existence temporarily as a small, small wobble in this field, and then once it's done what it needed to do, it dissolves back into this field. This cosmic quantum field, this vast, smooth continuum of activity, possibility, and localized vibration everywhere in space all the time is the most fundamental way of describing our universe. You 
and I and everything in the universe are simply gloriously temporary collections of vibrations in fundamental quantum fields. And we wobble into existence just long enough to taste a perfectly ripe peach, watch a sunset while holding hands with another collection of quantum vibrations. Most draining, the blockers must die, and help brother. a temporary fellow being in need. And then we eventually return to the background field from which we arose. A continuum field that has existed for as long as we can define time, space, and existence. And will probably always, always exist. The hottest and latest in physics requires a radical reframing of humanity's place in the universe. Fundamentally shifting the focus from us humans as some kind of authoritative benchmarks of existence and perception to the background continua, the contexts within which we observe ourselves as having vibrated Watch and evolved You're now. Shedding moats. Kill not only and you, are you and I not the most prominent things in the universe, ours might not be the only universe. <laughs> and not only are you not any more or less important than any other human being, but if we were to zoom in, and look at the particles of which you are composed. You and I are these sets of gloriously indistinguishable quantum uh, vibrations, uh, excitations in quantum fields. But although this quantum equitability is true at the scale of unfathomably huge and a tiny scale of the particles that compose you and me, you and I don't live and conduct our lives in either the level of expanding universes or the quantum realm. In some ways, this is a good thing. If I put an electron next to a solid barrier, there's a non-zero probability that I will suddenly measure the electron as existing on the other side of the barrier. This is a possibility of quantum mechanics and we determine it, we measure it all the time, we observe it. Luckily, this is not true of you leaning against the door of a high-speed train. You and I conduct our lives on the scale of this, right here on the surface of the earth with joy and pain and sorrow and pleasure and the notion that two humans are essentially indistinguishable sets of quantum vibrations in fields is cold comfort to a woman or a person of color or a gender non-conforming person or a person with a disability experiencing prejudice and bigotry at the hands of a privileged person. So I mention all of this, not because I think that this delicate observation that physics renders us all gloriously equal will have some kind of immediate effect on the current nearly catastrophic social and political situation in which we find ourselves, but it's an interesting metaphor. And it's a promising start because our current perception of the world around us is shaped by one particular set of dominant paradigms driven primarily by the culture, context, and society within which many of us exist, whether we chose to or not. This culture of profit, zero-sum competition, accumulation, and consumption, but perceptions can evolve, and paradigms can shift, and context can change, and metaphors, especially those that speak to the fundamental empirical nature of everything around us, can be very powerful. And this is good because shifting these sets of dominant attitudes is going to be very difficult. Hegemonies persist by unrelentingly convincing you that they're inevitable. And depending upon who you are within some given hegemony, the thing that often prevents you from disrupting it is fear. For those being subjugated, it's a real fear of physical harm. For those benefiting from it, it's a fear of a loss of privilege or more generally, a fear of change. This kind of softly, constantly bubbling fear shows up in a large number of places in our lives. For example, does this same fear affect you? What might happen if you quit your current job and you did that thing you've been thinking about for years, like starting a humanitarian organization? What might happen if uh, if you uh, what, what might happen if you uh, uh, decided that uh, um, 
what might happen if, if you're, you know, if you're in the tech world or the innovation world, what, what might happen if you stopped working on a long series of smartphone apps and instead worked upon a bigger idea that you've been kind of thinking in the back of your head for a long time, like solving poverty or f coming up with a way of preventing governments from hey, secretly hey, surveilling relax. their citizens. You're making this look a little too What easy. might happen Keep if you stopped working on what you're doing right now and instead worked on something gigantically awesome too? All of that stuff that I said about a particle collider around the moon or around the outer edge of the solar system, as awesome as that is, it's totally based upon extrapolations from existing current technology. What if instead, you join the effort to understand how to accelerate particles to higher energies within a much smaller space. So my colleagues are working on something called plasma wakefield acceleration. You can look up the details if you want, but in principle, if that were to come, if that were to uh, come to fruition and come to uh, to be able to be ready for, for prime time, in principle, we'd be able to reach the Planck scale in a much much smaller space. What if you did this instead? What if? What if? What if, what if the answer to all of these questions is indeed quite possibly nothing? But you currently don't know that. And you never will unless you take this leap and find out. And to me, the safety of ignorance will never compete with the scary beauty and the terrifying joy of knowledge. Always seek, always ask the big question, always Allow yourself the bravery of stepping into the unknown and always seek out new knowledge to vanquish the fear because you know what? This fear distracts us from some of the key, basic, objective, physical truths of reality. You and I don't need to be afraid of an almost infinite number of universes. And you and I don't need to be afraid of reconceptualizing our position in the, in the universe as being some kind of central thing instead of being Instead, instead to some perception of us being temporary collections of vibrations and quantum fields. We don't need to be afraid of these things because at the end of the day, we know one thing for sure. There is at least one universe. And you and I are parts of that universe. And when you and I, humans, ask questions about the universe, we Humans are the method by which the universe asks questions about itself. And when I see Ooh, the government of the United States putting children into literal cages on the U.S.-Mexico border, and you when I see that the, the third largest I mean, political true. party in the Swedish parliament in 2019, 2019 is rooted in fascism, and its representatives continually use racist, xenophobic, misogynistic language. And when I, when I see that we're, we've allowed decades of unfettered global capitalism to essentially destroy the earth and we're not acting fast enough to fix it, and when I think about my friend Melody and how the other kids made fun of her because of the color of her skin, and how she had a difficult time going to class because of it, and how she never went to high school. I feel anger. It's not just regular anger. Oh, I feel regular anger too, but as a physicist, I feel an extra layer of anger because when we allow these things to happen, we're betraying a cosmic truth. You and I are parts of the same universe and we're all in this universe together. And so back on that mountain, when I was a child, eight years old, I said, everything is terrifying. And after a long time, Melody said, yes, it's scary, but it would be scarier if I were out here by myself. And I looked up at the sky and I looked at her and I said, yeah. And the two of us looked up at the night sky. The stars and galaxies were watching us very far away.
Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank oh, you. You're too kind. Thank you. Thank you. I'd ask you questions. Thank you. If, Thank you. Thank you. If you hadn't reduced me to tears, we do have time for one or two questions. Do you have one? Let's. I mean, I, I have some too. <laughs> I'm sure it was 100% understandable. Every single physics everything, part. Good. You, everything. You all is now have. You all now have uh, uh, honorary PhDs in physics. So. Yes. <laughs> Does anyone have anything on their mind? There's a question right there. Just a, just a moment, you'll get a microphone. And thank you for waving vigorously. Yes. You said that we should not be scared about we living in a universe that is part of a set of many universes. But you also said that another universe might have been the cause of the impact on the background noise yes. waves. So how can we not be sure that another universe will not collide with ours and cause an impact on us? That's a... <laughs> yes, how? <laughs> well, it was great. See you later. Really... <laughs> no, the, the answer is that is, is a kind of a, it sounds like a, a logically circular thing, but the answer is that we're here and everything seems fine. That's really the answer. I mean, but the other part of it is that, yeah, of course, we don't, we cannot rule out the possibility that our universe is expanding right now, and it still is. It's still expanding. In fact, it's going faster and faster. But maybe there is some other universe that eventually it might actually bump bump into. But you can you can rest assured that that's probably not going to be a problem because think about what I said. We have this like this tiny subset volume that's our observable universe that, that anything we can possibly see or contact with is defined by that. The universe itself is way bigger than that. So if the kind of outer edge of the universe started to bump into another one it would probably the only way this propagate this uh, this bump or you know any kind of catastrophic thing uh, from the bump could ever possibly get to us could only at the it could only probably happen at the at the speed of light so you can probably rest assured that that's that's gonna be okay if we do actually collide within our universe also if you want to do some calculations if that were possible um, it would probably would only happen trillions of years from now and you'll be dead also we as a species probably gone I have potentially like a really stupid question, Please. but is it, I mean, the fact that we're talking about like directions and expansion, that hmm. seems to, to imply that time is a thing that exists and has a direction, ah. right? Yeah, so well, A, like we're not going to have time travel, so my, my Terminator uh, plan of saving the world is gone. So it seems that time travel, uh, at least going backward in time, is going to be a very, very difficult thing to do, if not impossible. It's another one of those kind of open questions that's right in the borderlands of science. It's like, what's outside the universe? I noticed that I didn't actually give you an answer, because we don't know. Um, it's also the answer, will we be able, ever be able to travel backward in time? We don't really know. It seems in principle possible, but to make it happen, we would probably have to do something that is almost as crazy as building a particle collider around the outer edge of the solar system. We would probably have to take an entire, like a star that's probably 10 times the size of the sun. We would somehow have to figure out how to collapse that into a tiny space of a few kilometers, uh, maybe even a few meters apart. And then somehow this would hopefully create a wormhole in space that would bend both space and time so severely that in principle you could traverse some in time to go back. But then you somehow have to figure out how to control that to point you toward a specific point in time. I don't know how to do any of these things. Anyone, and anyone that tells you they do, they're an, an, a, probably an amazing science fiction writer. You should read all their stuff. But there's nothing in there that tells us how to do this. In principle, it's possible. But going backward in time is probably outside of the realm of our civilization. So, damn it. And um, also, thank you. Yes. All right, let's do one more. Do we have one more? There's one down there's here. There's one right here. Yeah. Your invaders down. So uh, I tried to pay attention to all that you said. Uh, I didn't hear, I, I heard a lot about dark matter, but not dark energy. Yeah. Is that another school or? No, it's another, it's another one of the big open questions of physics that we're trying to solve with a lot of different directions, a lot of different experiments right now. And I did, it's mostly because of time, I didn't have to go into it. Very briefly, dark matter and dark energy, they both have the word dark in them, but they're very different things. Um, and some people have said that, you know, anytime a physicist says that they use, they, anytime you hear a physicist use the word dark in a theory, it means they have no idea what they're talking about. It's not entirely true, as I pointed out, right? I mean, dark matter has a, there's a reason why it's called dark, but dark energy really is a sort of like a question mark energy. Th that dark part there means no idea. Basically what happened, it's the other part of this, uh, the, the, um, the history of the universe's expansion. I said that right at the moment of the Big Bang, it did this inflation, the horse going to the size of the universe in 10 to the minus 32 seconds, and then it tapered off. 
And for like about 10 billion years, it went at the kind of a, a sort of understandable slow speed. And then a few billion years ago, for some reason, it started speeding up again. Not catastrophically, not yet again like infinitely, like the, the horse to 10 to the power minus, or 10 to the minus 32 seconds. But it started speeding up again. And we're like, what? No one really knows exactly why that happened, but there's a lot of fantastic research going on as to what turned on, what happened a few billion years ago, so that suddenly this, there's this, uh, this uh, accelerated expansion of space. Um, it's not something that it's entirely clear that we can say so much of collider experiments about right now, but it's mostly the it's mostly within the wheelhouse of uh, of astro astrophysics experiments, astro astronomy experiments. There is some overlap, but it's not entirely clear what that connection is right now. Again, once we get to the point of being our civiliz our civilization is able to uh, build a collider around the outer edge of the solar system, it's probably the connection is going to be much clearer. So. We're a little while away from that. I, I'm, I come from the humanities. As I said, I'm a late major. And thank you so much for explaining things so that I think I understand them, <laughs> which isn't quite the same as actually understanding them. But I, I don't, didn't read any science, basically. But I did read critical theory and semiotics and things like that, mm -hmm. which also involves sitting in a room and like thinking about like how meaning is arbitrary yep. and which words attach to which symbols, how that work, and like what is language in the brain and things like that. And what I always found at the end of that hour was that you know I would leave the room and it felt like reality was melting around me, mm. and I wonder like what happens in your brain when you engage with these ideas all the time? <laughs> like do you do you get this feeling sometimes that everything is very unstable and you need to turn it off? Um, no, not so much. It's it. I mean, it's a very good question. In fact, there's we could probably have an entire hour's worth of discussion about the the type of language that we use. You know, mm -hmm. that humanity has, especially like you know the uh, again we, white males over the years of the ones that have been the the mostly driving the the construction of science over the last few decades, last few centuries. The types of words that get used, why they're important, why these implicate, you know, why why they have why those ideas have helped drive you know the the things mm -hmm. that we've looked at for this in uh, for the last couple few centuries. And we could talk about that for a very long time, but. Really, what happens is one one of the good questions that often gets answers was asked was with respect to quantum mechanics, right? Because it's really true. Quant very, you often hear people say it's like, oh yeah, quantum mechanics is so weird and it has all these exactly. kind of bizarre things and no one can ever understand quantum mechanics. And there's a famous quote by some uh, physicist back in the 30s is like, oh, anyone who tells you that they've understand uh, they understand quantum mechanics volume? hasn't thought about it for long enough. <laughs> um, that's not entirely true, even though. It's non-intuitive for the reasons that I outlined. The way that things interact within the quantum realm, it's not intuitive for you and I, just because we were, you know, we've evolved on this very friendly, fuzzy, you know, planet with this narrow range of really nice conditions. That is very rare in the universe. The universe doesn't operate operate that that way normally. So when you start thinking about these things, the math is incontrovertible. Eventually, you get used to this concept, and you start to think of it. You start to bring these quantum right. concepts more right. into your yeah intuition as a scientist so it honestly the 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 gee whiz feeling it never goes away but the turn like the the feeling of your brain melting that that goes away you're like uh, you'd never i'd never be able to do my research if i was constantly walking around sir and it's like whoa oh yeah man. yes okay it's expanding you. universe I, right oh, dark, had... dark matter through my body yes yeah, so. that said uh, you were i mean yes so i went and so it's, i saw the atlas atlas detector like 10 11 years ago just before ah, it was finished Oh my God, it's like a cathedral. Yeah. You have to go now yeah, if there's should. a window to visit it. Yeah, I do advise. I have a little language tip for you because I'm very excited about your moon collider. Don't call it a moon collider. <laughs> it's, it suggests the moon will collide with yes. things and yes. that's nobody wants that. You'll never get the funding. Part, All part, right. part, part of the reason, <laughs> <laughs> I agree, I agree. Part, part of the reason I call it that is so that I can get people's attention exactly like that. It's like, uh -huh. oh, no, no, no. It's like, yes, let's do it. It's not a moon collider. It's not a moon collider. My secret is okay. <laughs> We're over time, unfortunately. We have to end. Thank you so much. Thank you, James Beecham. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Moats are dark out there. Just wait, brother. Go get some. <laughs> Tonight, I'd like to tell you about one of the big questions in science. It's a question that goes back at least two and a half thousand years to the ancient Greeks. And it's a question that has been discussed in this room many, many times over the past 200 years. 
but it's an important question, and I think it's important that, that we revisit it. And the question is simply this, it's what are we made of? What are the fundamental building blocks of nature that you and me and everything else in the universe are constructed from? That's the story I'd, I'd like to tell you. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, try and uh, give you an overview of our current understanding. Uh, I'd also like to try and give you an overview of where we hope to go in the future, of what progress we can, we can hope to make in the next uh, few years and few decades. And we're going to cover quite a lot of ground in, in this talk, I should, I should warn you now. Um, not least because I'm going to discuss every single thing in the universe, quite literally. <laughs> um, we're going to talk, amongst other things, about uh, what's happening at the world's most powerful particle collider, this is a machine that's called the Large Hadron Collider, or the LHC for short. It'll come up a lot in this talk. And it's a machine which is based underground uh, in a place called CERN, which is just outside Geneva. We'll also talk about uh, experiments in the last few years that look backwards in time uh, towards the Big Bang, that give us some understanding about uh, what was happening in the first few fractions of a second after uh, time itself uh, started to exist. And on top of all this, I also want to give you some idea about uh, the theoretical abstract ideas and even a little bit idea about the mathematics that underlies our current understanding of, uh, of the universe. Uh, because I'm a theoretical physicist. What I do is um, study the Next equations, the try feet. to understand the equations that, uh, that, that govern uh, the world we live in. And so I'd just like to give you a flavor of, of, of what that's about. Uh, at some point, I should warn you now, at some point, um, I'm even going to show you an equation. Okay? Uh, you know that you can get sent on training courses for this kind, of, uh, this kind of thing. There's a number one rule. The number one rule is never show them any equations. If you show them equations, you'll just terrify them. Um, at some point in this lecture, you're all going to be terrified. So just prepare yourselves. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, there's, there's a traditional way to start talks like this. Uh, the traditional way is to be very cultured and talk about what Democritus and Lucretius said two and a half thousand years ago and the ideas uh, that the ancient Greeks had about, about atoms. Um, but you know, I, I don't want to start like this. We, we've made a lot of progress in two and a half thousand years, and you know, there's just better places to, uh, to kick off a, a, a science talk. Um, so the first modern picture that we had uh, of what the universe is made of, or everything uh, we're made of, um, is this. So I hope this is uh, familiar to, to most people here. This is the periodic table of elements. It's one of the most iconic images in, in, in all of science. Uh, what we have here are 120-ish different elements. Uh, I should point out no less than 10 of which were discovered in this very building. And which constitute, or at least in the uh, 1800s, were thought to constitute everything that existed in, in nature. So it's certainly true that any material you get, you can distill it down into its component parts, and you'll find that all of those component parts are made of one of these 120 uh, elements. So it's, it, it's a great moment in science. It's really uh, one of the, the triumphs of science. Uh, it's also, I should add, uh, the reason that I stopped doing chemistry in school. <laughs> because if you're a chemist, this is basically as good as it gets. And you know, if we're honest, it's kind of a mess. Right? I, you know, everything in the universe is classified into things on the left that go bang if you put them in water, through to things on the right which really, if we're honest, don't do very much at all. It, you kind of organize everything into this stupid shape. So there, there's a, it looks a little bit like Australia. There's a big dip in the top and then, and then there's these two strips of elements that you have to put along the bottom because there's no room for them in the middle where they belong. You know, it, I don't know about you, if, if I was asked to come up with a fundamental classification of everything in the universe, this isn't what I would have gone for. Are there any chemists in the audience? <laughs> I'm sorry for you. <laughs> okay, but you know, I'm, I'm not alone in this. Uh, it's, it's not just uh, me that thinks this is a silly way to organize nature. Nature itself thinks this is a silly way to, to organize nature. Of course, we, we know this isn't the fundamental, uh, this isn't the end of the story. This isn't the fundamental building blocks. And uh, the first person to realize there's, that there's something deeper uh, than this um, was a Cambridge physicist called J.J. Thompson. So at the end of the 1800s, J.J. Thompson discovered a particle that was smaller than an atom uh, that we now call the electron. And in 1897, he announced this uh, in this room, in fact, in, in this very lecture series, 
um, to uh, a stunned audience, uh, an audience that was so stunned at least half of them didn't believe what he was saying. There was one very distinguished scientist who afterwards told J.J. Thompson he thought the whole thing was a hoax, that J.J. Thompson had just been uh, pulling their leg. Um, but of course, it's, it, it's not a hoax. This isn't the fundamental uh, elements of nature. And um, within 15 years of J.J. Thompson's discovery, his successor in Cambridge, a man called Ernest Rutherford, had figured out exactly what these atoms are made of. And this is the picture that, uh, that Rutherford came up with. So we now know that each of these elements consists of a nucleus, uh, which uh, is tiny. The uh, metaphor that Rutherford himself used was it's like a fly in the center of the cathedral. And then orbiting this nucleus in, I should add, fairly blurry orbits are the electrons, which uh, sort of fill out very sparsely the rest of the space. So that's a picture of, of, of these atoms. Um, subsequently, we learned that uh, the nucleus uh, is not itself fundamental. The nucleus contains uh, smaller particles. They're particles that we call protons and neutrons. And in the 1970s, uh, we learned that the protons and neutrons aren't fundamental either. So in the 1970s, we learned that inside each proton and neutron are three smaller particles uh, that we call quarks. Uh, there are two different kinds of quarks. Um, by the 1970s, I, I'm guessing physicists didn't have a classical Greek education, and they'd kind of run out of you know, classy names. So we, we call these quarks uh, the up quark and the down quark, OK? For no good reason. It's not like the up quark is higher than the down quark. It's not like it points up. It's just no, no good reason at all, the up quark and the down quark. So the proton consists of two up quarks and a down quark, and the neutron consists of two down quarks and an up quark. Okay. This, as far as we know, are the fundamental building blocks of, of nature. Uh, we've never discovered anything smaller than the electron, and we've never discovered anything smaller than uh, the quarks. So we have three particles of which everything we know is made. And it's, it's worth stressing, it, that's kind of astonishing. You know, it's, uh, we sort of take it for granted. We learn this in school. We don't really think about it deeply. Everything we see in the world, all the diversity in the natural world, you, me, everything around us, we just the same uh, three particles with slightly different rearrangements repeated over and over and over again. It's, uh, it's an amazing lesson to, uh, to draw about how, how the world is, is put together. So that, that, that's what we have. We have an electron and, uh, and two quarks. And um, you know, these aren't the fundamental building blocks that the Greeks had thought about. And they're certainly not the fundamental building blocks that the Victorians had thought about. But uh, you know, the spirit of the issue really hasn't changed. The spirit is exactly what uh, Democritus uh, said 2,500 uh, years ago. It, it's that there are like Lego bricks from which everything in the world is constructed. These Lego bricks are particles, and the particles are the electron and two quarks. It's a very nice picture. It's a very comforting picture. It's the picture we teach kids at school. It's the uh, picture we even teach our students in undergraduate university. And there's a problem with it. Uh, the problem is, it's a lie. It's, it's a white lie. It's a white lie that we tell our children because you know, we don't want to um, expose them to the, the difficult and horrible truth too early on. It makes it easier to learn if you believe that, that these particles are the fundamental building blocks of the universe. But it's simply not true. The best theories that we have of physics do not have underlying them the quark particle and the two quark particle. And the, 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 sorry, the electron particle and the two quark particle. In fact, the very best theories we have of physics don't rely on particles at all. The best theories we have tell us that the fundamental building blocks of nature are not particles, but something much more nebulous and abstract. The fundamental building blocks of nature are fluid-like substances which are spread throughout the entire universe and ripple in strange and interesting ways. That's the fundamental reality in, in which we live. Uh, these fluid-like substances we have a name for. Uh, we call them fields. So this, 
is a picture of a field. This isn't the kind of field that physicists have in mind. You know, this is, this is what you think a field is if you're a farmer or if uh, you know, you're a normal person. Uh, if, if you're a physicist, you have a very different picture in your mind when you think about fields. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the, um, the general definition of a field, and then we'll go through some examples so that you get, get, get familiar with this. Um, the, the physicist definition of a field is the following. It's something that, as I said, is spread everywhere throughout the universe. It's something that takes a particular value at every point in space. And what's more, that value can change in time. Okay, so the picture you have in your mind is a field, sorry, is a fluid which uh, ripples and sways throughout the universe. Now, it's not a new idea. It's, uh, it's not an idea that we've, we've just come up with. It's an idea um, which dates back uh, almost 200 years. And like so many other things in science, it's an idea which originated in this very room. Because, um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, this is the home of Michael Faraday. And Michael Faraday uh, initiated this lecture series in 1825. Uh, he gave over 100 of these Friday evening discourses. And uh, the vast majority of these were on his own discoveries on the experiments he did on electricity and magnetism. So he, uh, he uh, did many, many things in electricity and magnetism <laughs> over many decades. And in doing so, he built up an intuition for how electric and magnetic phenomena work, and the intuition is what we now call the electric and, and magnetic field. Uh -huh. So what he envisaged was Falling that threaded everywhere throughout space were these invisible objects All called the electric and magnetic happen. field. Now, you know, we learn this in uh -huh. school. Again, it's something that we sort of take for granted because we learn it at an early age and we don't sort of appreciate just how big of a radical step this, uh, this idea of Faraday's is. I, I want to stress, it's one of the most revolutionary abstract ideas in the history of science, that these uh, electric and magnetic fields exist. So, so, you know, let me just, you're supposed to do demonstrations in this, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not just a theoretical physicist, I'm a very theoretical physicist. It's, it's very hard for me to do any kind of experiment that's gonna work, but I, I'm just gonna show you something that, that, that you know, you've, you've all seen. Um, they're magnets, okay? And we all played these games when we were kids or when we were in school. You, you take these magnets and you move them together, and as they get closer and closer, there's, there's this force that you can sort of just, just feel building up that pushes, the pressure that, that pushes against these two magnets. And you know, it, it doesn't matter how often you do it, it doesn't matter how many degrees you have in physics, it's, it's just a little bit magical. You know, are you, and you all, you all know this. There's something just, just special about, about this, this weird feeling that, that you get between, between magnets. And, and th this was Faraday's genius. It was to appreciate that, that even though you can't see anything in between, even though no matter how closely you look, the space between these magnets will seem to be empty, he said, nonetheless, there's something real there. There's something real and physical which is invisible but is building up and that's what's responsible for the force. So he called them lines of force. We now call it the magnetic field. So on the, um, the this of course is, uh, is a picture of Michael Faraday. This is a picture of Michael Faraday lecturing behind this very table. Uh, here is a, a drawing from one of Michael Faraday's papers. Uh, it was pointed out to me earlier, when, when you leave, there's a carpet uh, just here. The carpet has this pattern. This picture just repeated on it over and over and over again. Um, and uh, on the bottom here is one of Michael Faraday's most famous demonstrations that, that he did here. So I'll, I'll just walk you through what, um, what, what Faraday did. Uh, the thing on the, uh, the thing on the right, there's a small coil um, uh, with a hand on it. Uh, this is a battery and the battery passes a current around this coil. And in doing so, uh, there's a magnetic field that's induced in this, it's what's called a solenoid. And then Faraday did, did the following thing. He simply moved this small coil A through this big coil B, like this. And something miraculous happened. When you do that, there's a moving magnetic field. Faraday's great discovery was induction. It gives rise to a current in B, which then over on this end of the table makes a, a needle flicker, like this. So it, extremely simple. You move a magnetic field, and it gives rise to a current which makes a needle flip, flicker on the other side of, of the table. This astounded audiences 
in the 1800s. Because you were doing something and affecting the needle on the other end of the table, yet you never touched the needle. You know, it was amazing. You could, uh, you, could, you could make something move without ever going near it, without ever touching it. We're kind of jaded these days. You can do the same experiment. You can pick up your cell phone, you can press a few buttons, you can call somebody on the other end of the earth within, within, within seconds. But it's the same principle that this was the first time it was demonstrated, that the field is real. You can communicate using the field. You can affect things far away using the field without ever, ever touching. So this is Michael Faraday's legacy. It's that there's not just particles in the world. There's other objects that are slightly more subtle uh, that are called fields that are spread throughout all of space. But by the way, if you ever want um, to really appreciate the genius of, of, of Michael Faraday, uh, he gave uh, this lecture in 1846. Um, gave many lectures uh, in 1846, but there was one in particular where he, he finished 20 minutes early. He, he ran out of things to say. So he engaged in some idle speculation uh, for 20 minutes. And uh, Faraday suggested that uh, these invisible electric and magnetic fields that he'd postulated uh, were quite literally the only thing you've ever seen. He suggested that it's ripples of the electric and magnetic field, which is what we call light. So it took, of course, 50 years for people like Maxwell and Hertz to confirm that, that this is indeed what light is made of, but it was Faraday's genius that, uh, that appreciated this, uh, that there are waves in the electric magnetic field, and those waves are the light that we see around. Okay, so this is Faraday's legacy. Um, but it turns out uh, this idea of fields was much more important than Faraday had realized. And it took over 150 years for us to appreciate uh, the importance of this field, of these fields. So what happened in these 150 years was that there was a small revolution in science. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, we realized that the world is very, very different from uh, the common sense ideas that Newton and Galileo had handed down to us centuries before. So in the 1920s, people like Heisenberg and Schrodinger realized that uh, on the smallest scales, on the microscopic scales, the world is much more mysterious and counterintuitive than uh, we ever really uh, imagined it could be. Uh, this, of course, is, is the theory that we now know as quantum mechanics. So um, there's a lot I could, I could say about quantum mechanics. Let, let, me, let me tell you one of the punchlines of quantum mechanics. Um, one of the punchlines is that uh, energy isn't continuous. Energy in the world is always parceled up into some little discrete lump. Okay, that's actually what the word quantum means. Quantum means discrete or, or lump. So the real fun starts when you try and take the ideas of quantum mechanics, which say that things should be discrete, and you try to combine them with Faraday's ideas of fields, which are very much continuous, smooth objects, which are waving and oscillating in, in space. So the idea of trying to combine these two uh, theories together is what we call quantum field theory. And here's uh, the implication of, of quantum field theory. Uh, the first implication is what happens for the electric and magnetic field. So Faraday taught us, and Maxwell later, that waves of the electromagnetic field are what we call light. But when you apply quantum mechanics to this, you find that these light waves aren't quite as smooth and continuous as they appear. So if you look closely at light waves, you'll find that they're made of uh, particles. They're little particles of light, and these are particles that we call the photon. Okay. The magic of this idea is that uh, that same principle applies to every single other particle in the universe. So there is spread everywhere throughout this room something that we call the electron field. Okay. It's like a fluid that fills this room and in fact fills the entire universe. And the ripples of this electron fluid, the ripples of uh, the waves of this fluid, get tied into little bundles of energy by the rules of quantum mechanics. And those bundles of energy are what we call the particle, the electron. All the electrons that are in your body are not fundamental. All the electrons that exist in your body are waves of the same underlying field. 
Okay? We're all connected to each other. It's like you know, the waves uh, on the ocean all belong to the, the same underlying ocean. Uh, the electrons in your body are the ripples of the same field as the electrons in my body. Okay? There's more than this. Uh, there's also in this room two quark fields. And the ripples of these two quark fields give rise to what we call uh, the up quark and the down quark. And the same is true for every other kind of particle in the universe. There are fields that underlie everything. And what we think of as particles aren't really particles at all. They're waves of these fields tied up into little bundles of energy. Okay? So this is the legacy of Faraday. This is where Faraday's vision of of fields has taken us. There are no particles in the world. The basic fundamental building blocks of our universe are these fluid-like substances that we call fields. All right. OK. Um, so what I want to do in the rest of this talk is uh, tell you um, where that vision takes us. I want to tell you about you know, what it means that we're not made of particles, we're, we're made of fields. And uh, I want to tell you what we can do with that and how we can best understand the universe around us. Okay? So here's the first thing. Um, take a box and take every single thing that exists out of that box. Take all the particles out the box, all the atoms out the box. What you're left with is a pure vacuum. And this is what the vacuum looks like. So what you're looking at here is a uh, computer simulation uh, using our best theory of physics. It's something called the standard model, which I'll, I'll introduce later. But it's a computer simulation of absolutely nothing. Okay? Th this is empty space, literally empty space with, with nothing in it. This is the simplest thing you could possibly imagine in the universe. And you can see it's, uh, you know, it's an interesting place to be, an empty space. You know, it's, not, it's not dull and boring. Uh, what you're looking at here is that even when the particles are taken out, the field still exists. The field is there. But what's more, the field is governed by the rules of quantum mechanics. And there's a principle in quantum mechanics, which is called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which says you're not allowed to sit still. And the field has to obey this. So even when there's nothing else there, the field is constantly bubbling and fluctuating in what's, quite honestly, a very complicated way. Okay? These are things that we call quantum vacuum fluctuations. But this is what nothingness looks like from the perspective of our current theories of, of physics. Okay, it's, it's worth saying that this is a computer simulation. Um, it, it looks a little bit like a cartoon, but it, it's actually quite a powerful computer simulation that took a long time uh, uh, to do. Um, but these aren't just theoretical. These quantum fluctuations that are there in the pure vacuum are things that we can measure. Uh, there's something called the Casimir force. Uh, the Casimir force is a force between two metal plates uh, that get pushed together, basically because there's more of this stuff on the outside than on the inside. And uh, you know, these are real. These are things that we can measure, and they behave just as we would uh, predict they would from, from our theories. So this is nothing. And uh, this brings me to um, uh, the more mathematical side of, uh, of the talk, because uh, there's a challenge in this. That this is the simplest thing we can imagine in the entire universe, and it's complicated. Okay, it's astonishingly complicated. And it doesn't get easier than this. You know, if you want to now understand not nothing but a single particle, well, that's much more complicated than this. And if you want to understand 10 to the 23 particles all doing something interesting, that's really, really much more complicated than this. So there's a problem in, uh, uh, well, it's my problem, not yours, in, in ad addressing uh, you know, this fundamental description of the universe, which is that it's just hard. Okay, the mathematics that we use to describe quantum fields, to describe everything that we're made of in terms of quantum fields, is substantially more difficult than the maths that arises in any other area of physics or, or science. Okay, it's, it's genuinely difficult. I, I can put this in, in some perspective. Um, there's a, a list of uh, six 
open problems in mathematics. They're considered to be the six hardest problems in mathematics. There used to be seven, but uh, some crazy Russian guy solved uh, one of them. Um, so there, there, there's six left. Uh, you win a million bucks if you can uh, solve any one of uh, these problems. Uh, if you know a little bit of mathematics, they're things like the Riemann hypothesis or P versus NP, and they're sort of famously difficult problems. Um, this is one of those six problems. You win a million dollars if, if you can understand this. Okay. So, so what, what does it mean? It doesn't mean, can you build a big computer and just demonstrate that, uh, that these are there? It means, can you understand from first principles by solving the equations, the patterns that emerge within these quantum fluctuations? Okay. It's an extraordinarily difficult problem. You know, it's, 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 it's right in the kind of thing I do. I don't know a single person in the world who's actually working on this problem. You know, that, that's how hard it is. We don't really even know how to begin to start understanding uh, these kind of ideas in, in, in quantum field theory. Okay. Um, th this theme about um, the mathematics being, being challenging is something which, which is going to um, uh, come back later in the talk. So I'd, I'd like just to I'd take a little bit of a diversion for uh, a few minutes and give you a sense about what we can do mathematically and what we can't do mathematically. Just to sort of tell you what the state of play is in terms of our, us understanding these theories called quantum field theories, which, which underlie our universe. So there, there are times uh, where we understand extremely well what's going on with quantum fields. And that happens basically when these fluctuations are very calm and tame. When they're not wild and strong, these ones are big, but when they're, they're much more calmer, when the vacuum is much more like a mill pond than it is like a, a, a raging storm, in those cases, we really think we understand what, what we're doing. And to illustrate this, I just want to give you this, this example. Um, so this uh, number G uh, is a particular property of the electron particle. And I'll, I'll quickly explain what it is. Uh, the electron is a particle, and it turns out the electron spins. It orbits rather like the Earth orbits. And it has an axis of spin, and you can change the axis of that spin. And the way you change it is you take a magnetic field like this, and in the presence of a magnetic field, the electron will spin, the electron will stay in one place, but spin, and then the axis of spin will slowly rotate like this. It's what's called precession. And the speed at which the axis of that spin processes is dictated by this number here. Okay. So it's not the most important thing in you know, the, the big picture. However, historically, this has been extremely important in the history of physics uh, because it turns out this is a number you can measure very, very accurately doing experiments. And so this number has sort of acted as a, a testing ground for us to see how well we understand the theories that underlie nature, and in particular quantum field. So let me tell you what you're looking at here. Uh, the first number is uh, the result of many, many decades of painstaking experiments measuring very, very precisely the, uh, uh, this feature of the electron. It's called the magnetic moment. And the second number is the result of many, many decades of very tortuous calculations sitting down with a pen and paper and trying to predict from first principles, from quantum field theory, what the magnetic moment of the electron should be. And you can see it's, it's simply spectacular. And that there's nothing like this anywhere else in science with an agreement between uh, the theoretical calculation and the experimental Measurements. It's sort of, I think it's, it's 12 or 13 uh, significant figures. It's, it's, it's really astonishing. Any other area of science, you'll be jumping up and down for joy if you get the first two I'm numbers right. Uh, economics, not even that. You know, just, <laughs> but but th this is where we're at in particle physics. On a good day, when we really understand what we're doing, we, it's, it's, it's substantially better than, than, than any other area of science. 12 significant figures. This, of course, I, I've shown it because this is our best result. Um, there are many other results that, that are nowhere near as good. And the difficulty comes when those quantum vacuum fluctuations start getting wilder and, and, and stronger. Uh, so let me give you an example. It should be possible for us to sit down and calculate from first principles the mass of the proton. 
Okay, we, we have the equations, uh, you know, everything should be there. We just you know, need to work hard and, and figure out what the mass of the proton is uh, just by doing calculations. Uh, we've been trying to do this for about 40 years now. Uh, we can get it to within an accuracy of something like 3%, which, which isn't bad. You know, we're 3% there, but, but we should be much, much better. You know, we should be sort of pushing these levels of, uh, uh, of accuracy. Um, and uh, uh, the reason is, is very simple. We, you know, we've got the right equation. We're pretty sure we, you know, we're solving the right equation. It's simply that we're not smart enough to solve. In 40 years, the world's most powerful computers, lots and lots of smart people, but, but just, you know, we haven't uh, managed to, to figure this out yet. Okay, there are other situations that I, I, I won't tell you about where, where we don't even get off the ground. There are some situations where, um, for very, fairly subtle reasons, we're unable to use computers to help us, and uh, we simply have no idea what we're doing. Um, so it's a slightly strange situation. Uh, we have these theories of physics, uh, the best theories uh, we've ever developed, as you can see by this, but at the same time, they're also the theories that we understand the least. And it's, to make progress, we sort of have this strange balancing act between you know, increasing our theoretical understanding and figuring out how to apply that to the experiments that, that we're doing. And again, it's a theme I'll come back to at the end of, uh, the, end of the lecture. Hey, you've got enough to pull All right, so so far I've been, I've been talking in a little bit of generality uh, about um, you know, what we're made of. Um, and this, this is the punchline uh, for the halfway point of the talk. Um, you're all made of quantum fields, and I don't understand them. At least I don't understand them as well as I, I, I think I should. So what I want to do now is, is go into a little bit more specifics. I want to tell you um, exactly what quantum fields you're all made of. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what quantum fields exist in the universe. Um, and the good news is there's not many of them. Uh, so I'll simply tell you all of them. So uh, we started with the periodic table. This is the new periodic table. Um, and it's much simpler. You know, it's, it's much nicer. Uh, there are the three particles that we're all made of. There's the electron and the two quarks, the up quark and the down quark. And as I've stressed, the particles aren't fundamental. What's really fundamental is the field that underlies them. And then it turns out there's a fourth particle uh, that um, I've not discussed so far. It's called the neutrino. It's not important in what we're made of, um, but it does play another important role in uh, elsewhere in the universe. Um, these neutrinos are everywhere. You've never noticed them, but since I began this talk, something like 10 to the 14 of them have streamed through the body of each and every one of you. Uh, as many coming from above, from outer space, as actually coming from below, because they stream all the way through the Earth and then, and then keep going. They're, they're not very sociable, they, they, they don't interact. So, so this is every, what everything is made of. These are the, the four particles um, that form the, the bedrock of, of our universe. Except then something rather strange happened. Uh, for a reason that we do not understand at all, Nature has chosen to take these four particles and reproduce them twice over. So this is actually the list of all the fields that make up particles in our universe. So, so what are we looking at here? Uh, this is the electron. It turns out there are two other particles which behave in every way exactly the same as the electron, except they're heavier. We call them the muon, which has a mass of something like 200 times the electron, and the tau particle, which is 3,000 times heavier than the electron. Okay, why are they there? We have no idea at all. It's one of the mysteries of the universe. Uh, there's also uh, uh, two more neutrinos. So there are three neutrinos in total. And uh, the two quarks that we first knew about are now joined by four others that we call the strange quark and the charmed quark. And then by the, by the time we got here, we really ran out of any kind of inspiration for, for naming them. We call them the bottom quark and, and the top quark. Okay. Uh, so I should, I should stress, we understand things very, very well going this way. We understand why they come in a group of four. We understand why they have the properties that, that they do. We don't understand it at all going this way. We don't know why there's three of these rather than two of them or 17 of them. Or that, that's, that's a mystery. But this is everything. This is everything in the universe. Uh, everything you're made of is, is these three at the top there. And it's only when you go to more exotic situations like particle colliders that we need the others on the bottom. But every single thing we've ever seen can be 
uh, made out of these 12 particles, 12 fields. Uh, these 12 fields interact with each other, and they interact through uh, four different forces. Uh, two of these are extremely familiar, the force of gravity and the force of electromagnetism. Uh, but there's also two other forces which operate only on small scales of a nucleus. So there's something called the strong nuclear force, which holds the quarks together inside protons and neutrons. And there's something called the weak nuclear force, which is responsible for radioactive decay and, among other things, for making the sun shine. Okay. Uh, again, each of these forces is associated to a field. So Faraday taught us about the electromagnetic field, but there's a field associated to this, which is called the gluon field, and a field associated to this, which is called the W and Z boson field. There's also a field associated to gravity. And this was really Einstein's great insight uh, into the world. Uh, the field associated to gravity turns out to be space and time itself. So if you've never heard that before, that was the world's shortest introduction to general relativity. Uh, and I'm not going to say anything else about it. I'll just uh, <laughs> let you figure that one out for yourself. OK, so, so th this, is, this is the universe we live in. There are 12 fields that give matter. I'll call them matter fields. And four other fields that are the forces. Ooh. And the world we live in oh, is uh, right. these combination of the 16 fields all interacting together in, uh, in interesting ways. So this is what you should think of uh, the universe as, as like. It's filled with these fields, fluid-like substances. 12 Trans matter, matter, four fire. forces. One of the matter fields Give starts to oscillate and ripple. Say the electron field the starts to, to wave up and down because there's electrons there. That will kick off one of the other fields. It will kick off, say, uh, the electromagnetic field, which in turn will also oscillate and ripple. There'll be light, which is emitted. So that will oscillate and ripple. At some point, it'll start interacting with the quark field, which in turn will oscillate and ripple. And the picture we end up with is this harmonious dance between all these fields, interlocking each other, swaying, uh, moving this way and that way. Th that's the picture that we have of the fundamental laws of physics. Um, we have uh, a theory which uh, underlies all this. Uh, it is, to put it simply, um, the pinnacle of science. It's the greatest theory we've ever come up with. Uh, we've given it the most astonishingly rubbish name you've ever heard of. Uh, we call it the standard model. Okay? When you hear the name the standard model, it sounds tedious and mundane. It should really be replaced for the greatest theory in the history of human civilization. Okay? That, that's uh, that, that's uh, what we're looking at. Okay, so um, this is everything, except it's not quite. Uh, I've, I've actually just missed out one field. There's one extra thing we know about, um, which uh, became quite famous in, in, in recent years. It was a field that was first suggested in the 1960s uh, by a Scottish physicist uh, called Peter Higgs. And um, it was, uh, by the 1970s, it had become an integral part of the way we thought about the universe. Um, but for the longest time, we didn't have direct hey, experimental evidence that this existed, where direct That's experimental so evidence means we make this Higgs field ripple, so we see a particle that's associated to it. And this changed. This changed famously uh, four years ago uh, at the LHC. Uh, these are the two experiments at the LHC that discovered it. They're, they're sort of the size of cathedrals and just packed full of electronics. They're astonishing things. This is called ATLAS. This is called CMS. Um, the, the Higgs particle doesn't last for long. The Higgs particle lasts about 10 to the minus 22 seconds. So it's not like, you know, you see it and you get to take a picture of it and, and put it on Instagram. Um, you, it's a little more subtle. So, so this is the data, and this little bump here is, uh, uh, is how we know that this Higgs particle existed. Uh, this is a picture of Peter Higgs being found. Um, <laughs> So um, th this was the final building block. You know, it, it, it was important. It was a really big deal, and, and it was important for, for two reasons. Um, the first is that this is what's responsible for what we call mass in the universe. So the properties of all the particles, things like electric charge and mass, are really a statement about how their fields interact with other fields. So the property that we call electric charge of an electron is a statement about how the electron field interacts with uh, um, the electromagnetic field. And the property of its mass is the statement about how it interacts with the Higgs field. So understanding this 
was really the, uh, was needed so that we understand uh, the meaning of mass in the universe. So it, it was a big deal. The other reason that it was a big deal is this was the final piece of our jigsaw. We, we had this theory that we called the standard model. We've had it since the 1970s. This was the final thing that we needed to discover to be sure that this theory is, is correct. And the astonishing thing is this particle was predicted in the 1960s. Uh, 50 years we've been waiting. Uh, we finally created it in CERN. It behaves in exactly the way that we thought it would. Absolutely perfectly behaves as we predicted using these theories. Okay, um, this is going to be the scary part of, of the talk. Um, you know, I, I've been telling you about this theory and I've been, I've been waving my hands, uh, pretending that I'm a field. Um, let me tell you what the theory really is. Let me just show you what we do. Uh, this is uh, the equation uh, for the standard model of, uh, of physics. Uh, I don't expect you to understand it, uh, not least because there are parts of this equation that no one on the planet understands. Um, but nonetheless, I want to show it to you for the following reason. Uh, this equation correctly predicts the result of every single experiment we've ever done in science. Everything is contained in in this equation. This is really the, the, the pinnacle of the reductionist approach to science. It's, it, it's all in here. So, you know, I, I'll admit, it's not the simplest equation in the world, uh, but it's not the most complicated either. You, know, you can put it on a T-shirt if you want to. In fact, if you go to CERN, you can buy a T-shirt with, with, with this equation on it. Um, let me just give you a sense of what, what we're looking at. Um, the first term here uh, was um, written down by Albert Einstein and describes gravity. What that means is that if you could solve this tiny little part of the equation, just this, oh, excuse me, uh, just this R, uh, you can, for example, predict how fast an apple falls from a tree, or the fact that the orbits of the planet uh, around the sun form ellipses, or you can predict what happens when two enormous black holes collide into each other and form a new black hole, sending out gravitational waves across the universe. Or in fact, you can predict how the entire universe itself expands. All of this comes from solving this little part of the equation. The, the next uh, term in the equation was written down by James Clerk Maxwell, and it tells you everything about electromagnetism. So all the exper experiments that Faraday spent a lifetime doing in this, this building, in fact, all the experiments over many centuries, from Coulomb to Faraday to Hertz to modern developments of lasers, everything in this tiny little part of, of the equation. So there's some power in, in these equations. Uh, this is the equation that governs the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force. Uh, this is an equation that was first written down by a British physicist called Paul Dirac. Uh, it, um, it describes the matter, it describes those 12 particles that, that make up the matter. Astonishingly, each of them obeys exactly the same equation. Uh, these are the equations of uh, Peter Higgs. And uh, this is an equation that tells you how the matter interacts with with the Higgs particle. So everything is, is in here. It's really an astonishing achievement. This is our current limit of knowledge. We've never done an experiment that cannot be explained by this equation, and we've never found a way in which this equation stops working. So this is the best thing that, that we can. Okay. It's the best thing that we currently have. However, we want to do better. Uh, because we know for sure that there's stuff out there that is not explained by this. And the reason we know is that although this explains every single experiment we've ever done here on Earth, if we look out into the sky, there's extra stuff which is still a mystery. So uh, if we look out into space, there are, for example, invisible particles out there. In fact, there's many more invisible particles than there are visible particles. Uh, we call them dark matter, but we can't see them obviously, because they're invisible, uh, but we can see their effects. We can see their effects on the way galaxies rotate or the way they bend light or, around galaxies. They're out there. We don't know what they are. Um, there's uh, even more mysterious things. There's something called dark energy, which is spread throughout all of space. It's also some kind of field, although not one we understand, that's causing everything in the universe to repel everything. Else. Uh, other things. We know that uh, early in the uh, first few seconds earlier than that, the first few fractions of a second after the Big Bang, the universe underwent a very rapid phase of expansion that we call inflation. Uh, we know it happened, but it's not explained by that equation that I, I just showed you. 
So these are the kind of things that we're going to have to understand if we're going to move forward uh, and decide what the next laws of physics are that go beyond the standard model. Um, I, I could tell you, I could spend hours talking about either of the, any of these. Uh, I'm going to focus just on the last one. I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, uh, about inflation. Um, so uh, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. And uh, we understand fairly well, well, we don't understand at all how it started. We don't understand what kicked it all off at time t equals zero. But we understand fairly well what happened after it started. And we know in particular that for the first, um, uh, the first 380,000 years of the universe, it was filled with a fireball. And we know this for sure because we've seen the fireball. In fact, we've seen it and we've taken a photograph of it. Uh, this um, is called the cosmic microwave background radiation, but a much better name for it is the fireball that filled the universe uh, when it gone. was much younger. Okay. Uh, the fireball uh, cooled down. Uh, its light has been streaming through the universe for 13.8 billion shots. years, uh, but we can see it. We can take this photograph of it and um, uh, we can sort of understand very well what was happening in these, in these first few moments of, of the universe. And you can see it, it, it looks literally like a fireball. There, there, there's red bits that are hotter, there's blue bits that are colder. And by studying this flickering that you can see in this picture, we get a lot of information about what was going on back 13.8 billion years ago when the universe was a baby. One of the main questions we want to ask is, what caused the flickering in the fireball? And um, we have an answer to this. We, we have an answer which, which I think is one of the most astonishing things in, in, in all of science. Um, it turns out that although the universe last, sorry, although the fireball lasted for 380,000 years, uh, whatever caused this flickering could not have taken place during the vast majority of that time. Whatever caused the flickering in this fireball actually took place in the first few very fractions of a second after the Big Bang. And what it was, was the following. So when the universe was very, very young, there was this, uh, uh, when the universe was very, very young, soon after the Big Bang, there were no particles, but there were quantum fields, because the quantum fields were everywhere. And there were these quantum vacuum fluctuations. And what happened was the universe expanded very, very quickly, and it caught these quantum fluctuations in the act. So the quantum fluctuations were stretched across the entire sky, where they became frozen. And it's these vacuum fluctuations here, which are the ripples that you see in the fireball. So it, it's an astonishing story. The, the quantum vac vacuum fluctuations were taking place 10 to the minus 30 seconds after the Big Bang. They were absolutely microscopic. And now we see them stretched across the entire universe, stretched 20 billion light years across the sky. That's what you're seeing here. And yet, you do the calculations for this, and it matches perfectly what you see here. So this is another of the great triumphs of, of quantum field theory. But it, it leaves lots of questions. Uh, the most important one is, which field are we seeing here? Uh, which field is this that's imprinted on, on the, the background okay, radiation? And the answer is, we don't know. Uh, the only one of the standard model fields it has a hope of being is the Higgs. But most of us think it's not the Higgs, but probably something new. Uh, but what we'd like to do moving forward into the future is get a much better picture of this fireball. In particular, get the polarization of the light. And by getting a picture of this, we can understand much better the properties of this field that was fluctuating in, in the early universe. OK, this looking forward is one of the uh, best hopes that we have for uh, going beyond the standard model and, and understanding new physics. Um, in the last 10 minutes, though, I'd, I'd like to bring you back down to Earth, um, sort of. Uh, um, we've got lots of experiments here on Earth where we're also trying to do better, where we're also trying to uh, go beyond the standard model of physics, beyond that equation, to understand what's, what's new. And there's many of them, but the most prominent is the one I've already mentioned. It's, it's the LHC. So what happened was uh, the LHC discovered the Higgs boson in 2012. And soon afterwards, it closed down for two years. Uh, it had an upgrade. And last year, in 2015, uh, the LHC turned on again 
uh, with twice the energy that it had when it discovered the Higgs. And the goal was twofold. The goal was firstly to understand the Higgs better, which it's done fantastically. And secondly, to discover new so physics geology, that lies like beyond the Higgs, new physics slow. beyond the standard model. So before I tell you what, um, what it's seen, uh, let, let me tell you some of the ideas we had, some of our expectations and hopes for what would happen moving forward. So th this is our favorite equation again. Um, the, the idea has always been the following. You know, if you're a Victorian scientist and you go back and you look at the periodic table of elements, then it's true that there's patterns in there that give a hint of the structure that lies underneath. Okay, there's numbers that, that repeat themselves. Where if you're very smart, you might start to realize that, you know, yes, there is something deeper than, than, than just these elements. So our hope as theorists is to look at this equation and see if maybe we can just find patterns in this equation that suggest there might be something deeper that, that lies underneath. And they're there. So let me give you an example. This is the equation uh, that describes the force of electricity and magnetism. And it's almost the same as the equations which describe the forces for the strong force and the weak nuclear force. Okay? In fact, you can see I've just changed letters. Okay? I, it's a little more complicated than that, but it's not, it's not much more complicated than that. The three forces really look similar. So you might wonder, well, maybe there's not three forces in the universe. Maybe those three forces are actually just one force. And when we think there's three forces, it's because we're looking at that one force just from slightly different perspectives. Maybe. Here's something else which is amazing. These are the equations uh, for the 12 matter fields in the universe, the neutrinos, the electrons, and, and the quarks. Each of them obeys exactly the same equation. Each of them obeys the Dirac equation. So again, you might wonder that, well, maybe there aren't 12 different fields. Maybe they're all uh, uh, the same field and the same particle. And the fact they look different is, again, maybe just because we're looking at them from slightly different perspectives. Maybe. So uh, these ideas that I've been suggesting oh. go by the name of unification. Hi. Uh, the idea that Bring the three forces are actually combined into one is what's called grand unification. Uh, and it's very easy. It's very easy to write down a mathematical theory in which all of these are just one force uh, which, uh, uh, which appears to be three from our, our perspective. There are other possibilities here. You might say, well, uh, this is the matter and these are the forces um, and the equations are different, but they're not that different because ultimately they're both just fields. So you might wonder if maybe there's some way in which the matter and the forces are related to each other. Well, uh, we have a theory for that as well. It's a theory that's called supersymmetry. And uh, it's a beautiful theory. It's very deep conceptually, um, and it sort of you know, smells like it might be right. Finally, you might be really, really bold. You might say, uh, well, can I just combine the lot? Can I just get rid of all of these terms and just write down one single term from which everything else emerges? Gravity, the forces, the particles, the Higgs, everything. Well, I've got something for you if you want that as well. It's called string theory. So we have a possibility for a theory which contains all of this in one simple concept. And the question going forward, of course, is, is are these right? You know, it's very easy for us uh, theorists to ha have these ideas. And I should say, these ideas are what's driven theoretical physics for 30 years, but we want to know, are they right? And uh, we've got a way of telling they're right. We do experiments. So I, I should say, if you want to know if string theory is right, uh, we don't have any way to test it at the moment. But if you want to know if some of these other ideas are right, then that's what the LHC should be doing. The reason that we built the LHC was firstly to find the Higgs, okay, at work. And secondly, to test these kind of ideas that we've been having to see what lies beyond. So the LHC has been running. It's been running for two years. It's been running like an absolute dream. It's just, it's a perfect machine. Uh, two years, uh, this is what it's seen. Absolutely nothing. All of these fantastic, beautiful ideas that we've had, none of them are showing up at all. And the question going forward is, you know, what are we going to do about it? Uh, you know, how are we going to make progress in understanding the next layer of physics uh, when the LHC isn't seeing anything and our ideas just, just don't appear to be uh, the way that nature works? Okay. 
Um, I, I should tell you off front, I don't have a good answer to this. Um, it's, uh, I, I say, my impression is that most of my community is a little bit shell-shocked by, by what happened. Um, there's certainly no consensus in the community to move forward, but I think there's three responses that, that sort of various people have had that I, I'd like to share with you. I think all three of these responses are reasonable up to a point. Um, the first response to the LHC not seeing anything is, is the following. It's, um, well, you know, you, you, you young kids, you're, you're so pessimistic. It's all doom and gloom with you. You just you need a little bit more patience. You know, it didn't see anything last year and it didn't see anything this year, but, but next year it's going to see something. And if not next year, it's the year after that that it's going to see something. It's, it's usually my, my very illustrious senior colleagues that, that, that have this, this response. And you know what? They could easily be right. It could easily be that next year the LHC discovers something astonishing and it sets us on the path to understanding the next layer of, layer of reality. Um, but it's also true that these same people were predicting that it would have seen something by now. And it's also true that um, this can't keep going for much longer. If the LHC doesn't see something within, say, a two-year time scale, it seems very, very unlikely that it's going to see something moving forward. It's possible, it just seems unlikely. So, uh, you know, we'll know, I, I hope with all my heart, that the LHC discovers something next year or the year after, um, but I think we have to prepare for the worst, but, but maybe it will. Okay, response number two. Uh, response number two, which, which is sort of also by, by similar people, um, uh, well, all our theories are so beautiful, they absolutely have to be correct, and what we really need is a bigger machine. Okay. Uh, ten times bigger, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. Okay. Again, they, 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 they might be right. I don't have a good argument against it. Uh, the obvious rebuttal, however, is that a new machine costs $10 billion. And there's not too many governments in the world that have $10 billion to spare for us to, uh, us to explore these ideas. There's one. Uh, one is China. And so if this machine is going to be built at all, it's going to be built by the Chinese government. I think the Chinese government would, uh, would see it as extremely attractive if the whole community of uh, particle physicists and engineers that are currently based in CERN in Geneva uh, move to a town that's slightly north of Beijing. I think, I think they'd uh, view that as a political and economic gain, and there's you know, a real chance that they may decide to build this machine. If they do, it's about 20 years uh, for it to be built. So uh, we're waiting slightly longer. Uh, there's a third response, um, and I, I should say the third response is, is kind of the camp I'm in. Um, I should mention up front, it's speculative, and it's probably not endorsed by most of, most of my peers. Uh, so this is really just my personal opinion at, at, at this point. Um, th this is my take on, on this. Um, Watch it. This is, you know, uh, this is the equation that uh, uh, we know is right. This is sort of the bedrock of our, our understanding. But although we know it's right, there's an awful lot in this equation that we haven't understood. There's an awful lot, to me, that's still mysterious in this equation. So although this equation looked like there were suggestions of unification, maybe they're just red herrings. And maybe if we just work harder and trying to understand this equation more, we'll find that uh, there are other patterns that emerge. So my response is, I think that maybe we should just go back to the drawing board and uh, start to challenge some of the assumptions and paradigms that, that we've been holding for, for the past 30 years. So I, I, I should admit, I, I feel quite energized, actually, by the lack of results for the LHC. You know, I, I, I sort of, it feels good to me that everyone was was wrong. You know, it's when we're wrong that we start to make, make progress. Uh, so I, I sort of feel quite happy by this, about this, um, and think that, um, you know, there's a very real chance that we, we could just, you know, start thinking about different ideas. I, I should say that, that, you know, there are hints in here. There are hints to me about, you know, mathematical patterns that we haven't explored. That there's hints in this about connections to other areas of science, things like condensed matter physics, which is the science of how materials work, or quantum information science, which is uh, the uh, attempt to build a quantum computer. All of these fantastic subjects have, have new ideas which sort of feed in to the kind of questions that, that we're asking here. So I'm quite optimistic that moving forward, uh, we can make progress. Uh, maybe not the progress that we thought we'd make a few years ago, but just, uh, just something new. Um, so that's the punchline of, of my talk. The punchline is that uh, this is the single greatest equation uh, that we've ever written down. Uh, but I hope that someday uh, we can give you something better.
Thank you for your attention. There's nothing discreet about the Schrodinger. invading. Your invader's back. One kill. You're being invaded. Find them before they find you. Envoy's dead. Kill the prime evil. Start that fight, you finished it. Your allies invaded. The enemy team's about to win this. Get moving. Fight's over. Opposing team killed their prime evil. Thank you. 